coming to yourself to the beat center we're coming with, yeah there's a lot of things <laughs> yes or how can we facilitate the no. <laughs> I know, I know. Thank you very much. Next oh, I mean, round it off. Yeah. Yeah. Right there? Okay, I'll ask him to pull it off as long as it's sitting right there. That's no, no problem then. One slide, but I didn't take it out of here. I don't know if it's just hooking up as much as it. But if after, just as a background. Yeah. In fact, uh, I just want to be. Yes, 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 where should we sit? This is your place. That's my name. What's the live and fancy? Don't look who's putting me in love with you. I like it. I like it. They were just going to talk? Now. Let me see what the. Uh, let me see what the. Uh, this one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh okay. okay. You guys already got So yeah. So did you want to intro like he's doing? Because I had questions already. Because I thought I guess, we were just I, I would. getting everybody else to I would. do their work. Yeah, yeah. No, almost short. Como no más, como media hora. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, and then I'll launch into my. Yeah. All right. So please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. A very old friend of ours, uh, a very good friend of ours, 
has been a friend for a very long time. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> let me let me rephrase that. A very young friend yeah, of ours that has been a friend of ours for a while uh, is going to moderate this last session, and I'll let her introduce uh, Assistant Secretary Burson and Ambassador Estiville. Uh, but I just want to say that Denise DeShaney, uh, who, as was mentioned earlier, is one of the, the founders of the Border Legislative Conference, a group that brings together state legislatures uh, from across the border region, uh, back when she was a, a senator in California, uh, somebody who's our, currently one of Jeronimo Gutierrez's bosses as, uh, as a board member of the North American Development Bank, uh, and is also works at, with the University of California, San Diego, uh, at the U.S.-Mexico Center there. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Thanks very much for agreeing to moderate this, our thank final you. conversation of the day. Well, thank you very much. And, and we get the challenge of being the, keeping everybody awake for the last panel. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that part. And, and we've given a short time to do what I think could be a very interesting conversation and partly um, and maybe use a, a bit of a close from, from some of what was done earlier today. Uh, we have two uh, really perfect speakers, and like Ambassador Shah Rukh Khan, I'm so excited I get to ask the questions instead of being the supplicant and the whatever um, that you usually position that we're in when, when I'm talking to these two gentlemen. Um, Alan Burson um, is the current Assistant Secretary and Chief Diplomatic Officer for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, and beyond what you can read in the bio they had in the paper outside, let me just sort of background a little bit because they didn't go far enough back. They only went to this DHS and since he's been in Washington part. Um, but in fact, at least we all first met him in the San Diego Tijuana border region when he uh, came there in the mid 90s to be the US attorney uh, for the San Diego sector. Uh, and uh, he first really, I think, engaged in border issues at that point. Um, and and has been with it kind of ever since in a variety of capacities. And um, for, for those of you who are just border people and only know him as DHS, um, he was also Secretary of Education in California for a while. Uh, and, and then uh, we talked about the cross-border terminal earlier, but he was actually on the San Diego Airport Authority at the time that we approved the cross-border terminal that hopefully will finish this year. So um, he's, he's had a variety of positions outside of... Um, the two that we're most familiar with, which is uh, Commissioner of CBP uh, a few years ago, and then um, currently at, at DHS. Um, ambassador STV, um, who is the in acting ambassador uh, of Mexico to the United States at the moment and deputy chief of mission uh, at the embassy here, uh, is from Mexico City, so he's not a native border person. We've been going back and forth on those things. Uh, the native border, the Mexico City, um, and, and, but his, my, I thought the most interesting piece of his bio was that his uh, bachelor's and, and PhDs and master's degrees were in literature, uh, and, but he, he later studied diplomatic studies at the Colegio de Mexico. Um, he has been in a variety of foreign service positions uh, of importance to all of us uh, for years, including uh, a, a period uh, when he was in charge of the North American desk uh, in Mexico City, where many of us, I think, first met him. Um, and in charge of consular policy there. Um, he was director of the cultural, which makes sense with the literature degrees now, cultural affairs for the um, foreign ministry uh, for a while, uh, and then director of, of the North America. And then he went to London um, and became deputy head of mission there. Uh, and again, acting ambassador in London before returning here and now uh, with our mission here in Washington, D.C. as the embassy uh, of Mexico in, in United States. So I understand Alan has some pictures he wants to show. Uh, and then each of them will do short, <laughs> five minute, we promise, so I can ask lots of hard questions just for fun. No, so th thank you, uh, Senator Duchenne and uh, Ambassador. Uh, always uh, an honor and a, a, uh, an education to uh, uh, discuss the changes that we've seen even uh, in, the, in the last 10 years. But I do feel a little bit, uh, when I'm listening to uh, Denise, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I do feel a little bit like the Forrest Gump of, of this border. <laughs> you know, I first met Senator Rufo when he was uh, just had uh, become the first Panista governor of uh, Baja California. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that uh, Senator Duchenne was promoting and, and we were working on, they were matters that people would look at us and say, you, uh, you're, you're out of your mind. It, it, cannot, it cannot happen. Uh, and most of the time, you know, Forrest Gump 
turned up at the big events, but most of them were not happy events. So I'm delighted to be uh, at this point in the trajectory of the U.S.-Mexico border where we, uh, we look back and say uh, this was uh, 20 years ago, 1995, mm. uh, was, was uh, what the San Diego Tijuana border looked like. Uh, it, was a, it was a border in which uh, the, uh, both De Efe and Washington had very little interest in. Uh, we had just come through the Proposition 187 uh, 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 summer, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the, the world uh, seemed focused on the negative, uh, and the, uh, the thought that we could uh, spend 20 years in, in uh, building what has been built in terms of a platform for uh, the emergence of North America uh, is, is really an extraordinary period to have uh, lived through. So I, I just, uh, I don't usually uh, use pictures, but uh, the, uh, some pictures and numbers, and then I think it sets the stage for uh, the discussion. So, so uh, the New Mexico reality, let's see, it was, um, let me just be sure I have, uh, uh, the numbers, uh, are, are extraordinary. Uh, we have uh, f just under $600 billion a year in, in uh, bilateral trade compared uh, at the outset of uh, NAFTA, 1994, 21 years ago. Uh, our foreign trade uh, was, uh, was $80 billion. Uh, the uh, the uh, extent to which uh, uh, we have uh, U.S. residents, uh, you know, the, the, the exchange, people focus on illegal migration, but actually the massive exchange of visitors across and uh, back and forth, across, either wealth across the border, but also visiting uh, the country, uh, the extent of foreign uh, direct investment, uh, Mexi large Mexican companies owning uh, many uh, large enterprises in the United States and, and vice versa. Uh, what I am pleased to say, though, is that this economic reality has actually uh, produced a, uh, a uh, government response, a regulatory response that maybe we can get into that has not been a, uh, uh, a constraint. Business people would say it has not been the facilitator it should have been, but it has not turned out to be the constraint. And what we've ended up with as a result of NAFTA, as a result of, uh, of, of the political processes becoming uh, uh, much more uh, integrated over the last 20 years uh, is that uh, we have a shared uh, production platform that will be the envy of the world uh, over the next uh, generation. Uh, the European Union, this extraordinary experiment in Europe that's so important to uh, both of our countries, uh, is a uh, experiment in shared sovereignty that is not clear that it will uh, actually uh, succeed. Uh, given the pressures that are uh, in, in, involved. But a shared production platform, doing business together, uh, now complementing the close familial ties that we've had that are now, instead of being uh, shuttled off to the side, are now being acknowledged as one out of four uh, U.S. Uh, school children in public education are uh, Latino uh, in, in origin. I, it's... It, el futuro ya no es lo que era antes. <laughs> uh, the the uh, the last point uh, is just that this is this is how we have changed the way in which we look at the relationship. No more finger pointing. Uh, even on those issues that are tough between us, we've we've actually worked out uh, ways to address border violence. We've worked out ways to address uh, migration. Uh, the Border Patrol sits down with the NAMI and figures out how most humanely to return uh, uh, migrants. Uh, the number of migrants is, uh, is now uh, a net uh, 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 outflow. Uh, who would have thought that uh, illegal migration is now 80% uh, of the people being arrested in, uh, in uh, South Texas are actually uh, a South, a Central American? And who would have thought that... Uh, that Mexico would step up and recognize now as the 13th largest economy of the world that it is a receiving country and a transit country for uh, migration. And it asserts the rule of law in, uh, in this, in this, uh, on the southern border in a way that 
uh, frankly, has completely uh, changed the, uh, the, the nature of uh, our migration problem in, in South Texas. And don't think it isn't uh, understood, but this is not based on, it's based on, on mutual self-interest. It's based on a vision of seeing the world together uh, that uh, was simply uh, not possible. And then lastly, I would say uh, uh, we exemplify the notion that the border line, which for so much of U.S.-Mexican history, La Linea, was the divi division between us. Uh, we now live in a global world with a massive flow of goods, people, ideas, images, and uh, most of uh, the old border line uh, has given way to uh, has given way to flows of goods, people, Perfect. ideas, and what that has done is change uh, change us from uh, you know this is what our uh, transport net network will look like uh, over the next uh, uh, 10 to 15 years because of the long distance trucking and the working through of all those issues. Una región, una región, and. Uh, you know, I, I think when Denise first was talking about that in the California legislature, about us being a region with Mexico, or Governor Rufo in, uh, in Mexicali talking about we're really one region, you know, people would look and say, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's a pipe dream, not a vision. So I, I, uh, I, I offer that to say that, uh, that uh, El futuro ya no es lo que era antes. We, we, we live in a new world that many of the people in this room have actually constructed. So thank you for letting me show my pictures, as you say. Thank you for the <laughs> trip down memory lane. You know. Thank you. I, I'll just footnote before Ambassador Steve presents, but I also need to credit, um, and he's not here anymore, but it, it, since it's our wrap-up day in, in sort of event, but uh, it was then Representative, Texas Representative Henry Cuellar, who was my partner in starting the Border Legislative Conference. So, And Ernesto Rufo at the time was the head of the Border Governors Conference, if I recall correctly. So goes around, comes around. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Alan. You know, I met Alan about as well, or maybe... 20 years ago, when all the, the leaders of the Mexican diplomacy used to say, go and meet Alan, you have to know Alan, because he's uh, one of the, the men that can really have a vision about the border. And so I'm very flattered to enjoy this, this moment with you and have a, a talk with you. And I will tell you, Alan always has this possibility of putting together the vision of what has happened in the past and in the future. And if you ask him, he can also write about... Uh, how this border, because of many reasons that we cannot go in deep now, on this 19th century became so this uh, standoffish uh, positions and, and all that. But I believe that Alan has also something that for me has been very, very appealing all the time. That the way he can talk about these lines and lanes, I would say, in the border, that instead of in a horizontal line become a really network of things that happen up and down from south to north. And this is a market of interests, and these are moments in which we have together seen elements in the border that had been game-changing or, or, or alerting. We traveled together, I remember, to the Laredo area and started to ask why, why the time to cross was about two to three hours, one moment, and we said, how if we put a possibility for any truck driver to go in one direction or the other with a sign that says, this is 45 minutes, this is 30 minutes, this is two hours. And from that night, the, the next day, the times were reduced for about uh, half, <laughs> just because we thought about it. <laughs> so you know, so there are, Alan can e express how many interests in the border are there. And I would like to tell you something that I lived in, in Britain, which was when the COP16 was being arranged by Mexico about uh, environmental stuff. And the, there was a great man, the m m most important advisor of Gordon Brown at that moment, Lord Stern, who told us, do not think about climate change only in terms of good reasons. That uh, Think about the money. Think about the m economic incentives that are there. And Alan has been very, very intelligent, and that's why I feel that I have done something in, with you, trying to, uh, to underline the good and positive interests. But there are many interests as well that have taken advantage of the asymmetry of the border. And what we are trying to do to facilitate is to provoke a difference in which the good and most important inter economic interests become the, the, the real part of all this. And 
he, Alan all the time, and I would try to do the same, talks about how when you put all this, those positive interests, it starts growing, the whole thing grows, the, the region grows, and all this happens. I think that the, the important question here is, are there the incentives to really consider that we have done a change? One of his visions, and I share it as well, I'm taking advantage of his presence here, is the 80-20 rule. We have to check, we, we always have 80% of the things that happen, that very normal, usual trend, positive, nobody is, is positive about. And 20% that, well, we, we have to check. And we usually do not put the resources in a correct form. And we start, we have to do, what we have to do is to put 80% of our resources to check this 20%, which is complicated, and facilitate with only 20, 15% the rest. And we are, mm -hmm. all these things that you have in here in all day, pre-clearance, the uh, pedimento together, all that is in that aim. I made a small list when you were, while you were talking about if those incentives are there. And my answer, I'm a complete optimist, is that yes, the incentives are there. First, we see each other to more as a region and as a region that has to compete with other regions. Something that can be expressed in things like, for example, the negotiating TPP and the transatlantic as well. When the United States start to, to talk about transatlantic seriously, they will have to talk a lot about uh, regulatory cooperation. And with that in, in, in the table, we will have to check again our cooperatory regulation, which is very, very important, and we have to do much more in that area. It's, it's, it's a lack that we have in cooperation. But as seeing each other as a North American region trying to compete provokes that this border and all the positive things that are in this border and the capabilities that it has will spark us something, something better. Uh, migration, as you say, migration is different. We are more a second generation migration today. And I think that the center of debate is changing from ideological, cultural thing to something more economic. And all these uh, actions that are, have been taken by the uh, Obama administration, one way or the other, at the end, in some years, will provoke that what is important is to stress what is called in the dreamers. This engine that the U.S. has here of people that want to work and want to produce and, want to, and, and, and can help all this. Uh, in that sense, migration is in a different moment. Energy, the reform in energy. We, you, you had a panel here about the incentive of energy that could provoke a complete difference in the border and new flows. In that picture that Alan showed, if you do it in, for example, telephone calls, it's amazing what happens. It becomes uh, in airplanes. We are also at the edge of having, a, cannot be called exactly a free sky, agreement, but it's something that is going to provoke a boost in all the different uh, uh, flights between Mexico and the United States in a very different way. Telecommunications, as I was saying, is, is, is amazing. Financial. And I will put here a, a, a moment. I'm in very in favor, it will be my last words, about something that has not been so mentioned. The Boundary Water International Commission, CELA on our side, has been a great institution that was built for many, many years and today works incredibly well in the technical way and solves technical problems and then it presents to, the, to, to something uh, political. I believe that in 50 years we will have an incredible institution that we were going to talk about. It is going to be the NetBank. Is going to be one of the most important institutions for development. And that is uh, starting to move in a different way. But I feel, well, Jeronimo is here, b that he has put in, in place all different elements to provoke that this development bank really is, starts financing in a different way a, a region. So it's another incentive to, to see that. Uh, reacting cap for emerging capability. Here is Bosco. Bosco lived by himself what was Katrina. And what happened then? And the way Mexico said this in a moment of emergency said, we cannot be talking too much about how we're going to cross this or that. We have to work together in that direction. And for me, it was 2009. You cannot imagine how much it rained in 2009. And we were one inch of water in the Rio Grande mm -hmm. the, for the decision of breaking some infrastructure in a way for not um, um, affecting terribly the, the bridges in, in Laredo. We were one inch away from it. But we were cooperating, not imagine how we were cooperating, we were talking in five minute, a five, five minute phone call, how much it is, how much water, tell me how is the, the whole thing happening. We have in the border capabilities for reacting amazingly once. And I will close with what has been said here, Central America. I think today, 
the new perspective for all this is how we all together start being a region that comes from the Darien till Canada. And in that sense, the new key, the, the new game is going to be in that uh, position. The way what happened in 2013 with unaccompanied migrants in the Mexico-US border provoke a different way of talking e about this, these elements. There are a lot of things that are still being th th there that we have to solve. But my quest th the question, do our in Alan terms, how we put the incentives for the economic part, for all these uh, stakeholders, the best are here, uh, to react for trying to provoke those interests to be the ones that are going to prevail? My answer is yes, because of these incentives that are in some way are new. Thank you. Interesting. All right. So, so I'm going to go back, and, and we're short on time, so I'm going to combine some, some thoughts and questions. But um, since our topic was the evolution of, of the border management, and I, I'm going to go back to a couple things that people said earlier this morning. Um, Ambassador Sarukhan's panel, we talked about the mishmash of agencies when he was uh, questioning the members of Congress who were here. Um, Governor Senator Rufo um, suggested if he was allowed to wave his magic wand, he would recreate the commission on the border. Um, and, and as I thought about some of those, what occurred to me, I, I started to make a list like you. And I only went back as far as the Bush-Fox-U.S.-Mexico business par partnership for the border for the 21st century. Now we have the 21st century border initiative, management initiative. We have the, the joint working committee, the JWOC that works with the, the, from transportation. We have bridges and border crossings, which meets on a regular basis, but it's mostly sort of State Department folks. And now we have the higher level economic dialogue, which we all love. But why do we have so many? And we never implemented my favorite piece of Merida, which was the pillar four on sustainable communities and regions. Um, how do we, is it too much of a mishmash? Do we have too many agencies and do we need to th rethink how to structure that discussion? And it leads directly into, I'm glad you raised the IBWC, it was sort of on my list too. But we talked this morning about things that are, you know, we're on a 21st century border with 20th century process and 19th century infrastructure, right? How, how do we move some of those dialogues? And the IBWC, I think, is a, is a question. Um, it was, it's, it's a early 20th century structure. Have our government structures kept up with the evolving economy, I think is really the heart of the question. We, have, we keep changing them and moving them, but we mostly layer them. And the question is, how should we have a, what's the government structure that helps move us forward? Uh, maybe my answer will be a, a bit <coughs> naive, but in 2009 we had the spark of the flu uh, and a group of the uh, Organization for World Health arrived to Mexico and Mexico gave an example of reacting to that and put something that works. And it's a technical group that puts in a table all the information that is there, shares that information, presents the problem, and only one person from the technical goes to a political group that's start talking about and takes decisions, political and the um, policies. You can make the list as long as you want. One way or the other, those agencies are arranged in a technical group that puts together information and decides about the problems and goes to a political one who has to take a leadership in, in that. Maybe the labels are different from one side uh, and, and sometimes, but if you see the map, all the time has been like that. Some the IBWC is one, I believe, is one of the best. Well, of course, it, it took a long time to do it, but it has a very technical perspective, knows its limits. Crossing some border, or the, the one that is the U.S., is very technical as well, puts together all the information. Sometimes because of f lack of continu continuity, changes of governments, or maybe that the government needs the political leverage that gives to launch something different, and I understand perfectly well, and it's very important in political terms, we are in the political arena changing frequently. But if you see, for example, many of the factors that have been set here, preclearance. Who started preclearance? The ideas 15 years ago. And in a technical group were analyzed and analyzed and has been only with that technical grouping and ana analysis and changing some elements that has, the, and, and the stakeholders have been the same. Well, Jose Martí is here. He has been a stakeholder for That's that. I don't know how, how many years. Okay. And <laughs> that changes. The stakeholders <laughs> change the top, right? <laughs> and that technical, the technical group has put all those elements together. Right. And we have the guidance of the political group as well. 
Senator Rufo's idea. I would subscribe a part of, uh, of that. We need in the border, s mostly with some of the elements that have a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Cases of drug trafficking, cases of emergency. Mm -hmm. I believe that if we take the example of the IBWC, in which we can, but it, because that happens. Two weeks ago, we had a, the, the, the impact of a helicopter affected by, by shooting. And the reaction of the Mexican government was immediate, less than hours. And it was in the even of an election in which all the security agents of Mexico mm -hmm. were spread all out uh, around the, the country in not the, the, the easiest conditions. And they reacted incredibly. In, in less than two hours, there was a Mexican helicopter patrolling the zone. We have the elements in the technical group to react. Although you can mention all these groups, I believe that those elements are all the time together. And what has been done is trying to leverage more the political part to put these wills in exactly what Alan says. No finger pointing. We have an, uh, a together idea of what we have to do and try to work in that direction. Let me uh, build a little uh, on Alejandro's uh, uh, view about the, uh, the, uh, the, the changing politics and the way in which this operates. And this is yeah. going to sound a little different. I'd actually be interested in your view, Denise, because you know, we all, it, it's, it's certainly not neat. Uh, the regular, the, the agency structure is not neat. And yes, it could be improved. And yes, I think it would probably be an interesting uh, uh, academic study that could contribute. But here, here's actually the way I've come out at the other end yeah. of, the, uh, of the cycle, which is that uh, you want the private sector and the, and the civic sector and the people driving this uh, right. phenomenon. And ultimately, uh, and, and, you know, I think our Mexican colleagues and, and, and friends are in a better position. Look at how boisterous Mexican politics is now. You know, and, and uh, look at... If we could our, just imitate their six-week elections. But, but you know, look at, look at how irrational people look at what's going on in our politics is. So, so there's a... I, I, I've reached the conclusion that that's democracy that that's actually what democracy is. And, and does it, could it work better? Could it be improved? But the fact of the matter is we don't want to create uh, centralized powers. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have uh, uh, organizations that control the border mm -hmm. or that you have to go through to get to the border. We need decentralization. We need uh, 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 lots of uh, uh, opportunities to uh, make this border change, whether it's the NAT Bank whether it's the, the, uh, the public-private uh, uh, sectors that are generating uh, so much of the activity. So I, I say, yeah, we could certainly be better than we are, but you know the fact that it took 15 years to do pre-inspection? <laughs> nobody has ever accused me of, uh, of uh, uh, b being uh, uh, patient. Uh, I'm not by nature, by temperament, a patient uh, uh, person, but I will tell you that uh, because all of us get to live somewhere between 50 and 100 years, if we're lucky, uh, we tend to think of, uh, of all this as taking a lot of time. Actually, in the scope of U.S.-Mexican history, 15 years is, uh, you know, 10 percent, uh, less than 10 percent of, uh, of the scope of our history. So uh, the change that's taken place in the last 20 years has is, is actually made me a, uh, a believer in uh, let the people actually uh, operate and the regulators, our job in the government is to actually design a new way of dealing with all of these groups in ways that, uh, that don't just block. Yes. Don't block. Uh, and I, I, you know, we're not perfect uh, to be sure, but we're, uh, that's the way I do it. I wouldn't look to do a if, if, you know, the commission, the only, the only thing that I would commend of, of Senator Rufo's commission idea is that you want to have a place that can actually publicize concepts, not control it, no. but actually Regulate. put something on the agenda and, and then let the uh, process uh, determine. But that, that'd be my I get, I, I mean, that's, I, and my example, and it goes to, you know, the, the, the IBWC example, you can look at the recent agreements around the Colorado River. Right, which were uh, both Rachel and Ambassador Sarokan and others who have been here today were part of, of that success. But it was it turned the process a little bit on its head. It used a lot more stakeholder input. Um, it used the technical process, it, and, and it happened. But it said, when river watersheds, where's my friend from McAllen? Is he still here? 
um, the mayor of McAllen was here yesterday, <laughs> and and we were talking about watersheds and and the real world of the border. The regions are by watershed or by environmental. It, 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 they're they're logical places. That's what makes a region in some ways. And so how we decentralize but still have decision points at the federal level and know which one of the 14 organizations is doing which thing to you is, I think is, is more of the question. How do we design it not to control but to facilitate and to be able to unleash the creativity which I think we all agree comes from the locals. The creativity about how to think about something crazy like a cross-border terminal or how to invent a century lane or how to some of the stuff they're doing in Texas and, 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 you know, how do we get that to come to the place where it can be blessed by the federal governments because, in fact, we are an international border. I present these, student, these to my students every year, and they just look at us and think, how, how come you have so many dysfunctional, mismatched agencies, right? Um, and, and, and so how do we think about what would be that new structure that lets all this creativity, whether it's entrepreneurship or students, student exchanges or workforce development or watershed management flourish? So I guess I would say that it's flourishing. It's flourishing not as quickly as we yeah. would like, yeah. not as neatly as uh, we would want, but, uh, you know, th I, th the nature of cross-border democratic politics, the, the fact that we are now an intermestic, you know, what Bayless Manning would, would say is intermestic. We're not international because, you know, we're neighbors. Our politics, everything that happens affects ourselves. But we're not domestic because we're separate sovereignties. We're intermestic. And, and that means that, that it's, 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 going to be a, it's going to be a rowdy affair. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, it's a tough one to, to exactly why they flourish. They, fl they flourish when they give wrestles, when they deliver things to, to the biggest paradox maybe here is that we have to realize what Alan also presented, how big is the whole thing. I'm a Chilango from the DF that knows mm -hmm. the border. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I know parts of the border that another person for the border does not know. I know a place called, an amazing place near Lajitas, it's called Contrabando, Texas, which <laughs> with the name is, is, is like a novel <coughs> by itself. It, it's a place that uh, was used for uh, shooting cinema. But it's, uh, at the same time, which is a ghost town, it can explain many things in the Big Bend. And I have known as well the, uh, Chaparral or Porta Mexico. Mm -hmm. There cannot be more difference between those two places in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they are amazing. And the paradox comes to taking in consideration the, the, the stakeholders of, of the border. Yes, of course, they have the most creativity thing. But at the same time, we have to put that together with comprehensiveness mm -hmm. about the complete U.S.-Mexico relationship because you stakeholders of the border say that something that happens there in Laredo has had a huge impact in Mexico DF and today because of what we are dealing in China. It's, it's, it's the complexity that we have to, to, to talk about. At the same time, sometimes we think we have to think big, great ideas. And those ideas can only be accomplished if we play uh, the other way uh, they I was talking about what in baseball is called a small ball, in which you uh, go there and without not so much leverage, put uh, someone who touched the ball and not steal some base. And, and at the end, you make four rounds with one hit. <laughs> and some of the projects of the border have been done that way, without, always without thinking big at the same time, because pre clearance is a big, and railroad is a big thing that is there. We are going to shift from truck driving to railroads. It's going to happen maybe in 30 years. But we have to think that big, and we are going to do it small, small, piece by piece. So this Mexico-US relationship all the time challenges us because puts together small things with big things, big thinking in time with short uh, uh, benchmarks every moment, and, of course, who plays the important interest of the people in a small town there in the, in the Big Bend, and what happens in Tijuana, at the same time, all together. Mm. I would s be very in favor of what Alan says, that that's democracy. The, the only a very democratic and strong institutions can do that. And I go there to, IBWC has done that, NatBank is doing that, NatBank is a huge list of small, small, small projects, mm. and at the same time has to think big, 
and that institution is doing, and in security, we are doing the same. We, have, we need a big police, in, in a better and stronger uh, Policia Federal, in our case, the Border Patrol has worked in that direction as well and has to react to small things and big things at the same time. It's a complicated situation, but what I would not subscribe is only central, only small, only big, only. It's all that together. That's the way to flourish those institutions. Interesting. All right. I'm going <laughs> to take liberty and ask for maybe one or two questions. I know we're over time, but I didn't pass the deadline, deadline time yet. So. Because we started late, so we get dispensation. One. Okay. Back of the room. Uh, hi. Cameron McLaughlin, uh, Department of State. This question is for Mr. Burson, really. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk and, and very positive, exciting talk about the public-private partnerships that are going on, uh, both in border infrastructure and in border management. Um, but I wanted to ask a sort of a glass half-empty question, if I could, which is, um, do you, is there a way that we can still talk about the, the deficit in infrastructure funding that, that all U.S. agencies that really work on the border are still facing? And is there, uh, do you worry that, that, you know, in talking about all of the good news on public-private partnerships that we're not talking about and not making people aware that there is a huge deficit in funding for public infrastructure? And how do we share both of those stories, essentially? So Two points. So we uh, it conservatively estimated that we're $6 billion uh, uh, behind the, uh, the, the requirements of, of bricks and mortar, and I, I agree with you. But I, 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 if, in fact, the, uh, the trend of the border is that we are no longer, that much less important is, um, is the east-west line, and, and we're dealing with the flows, uh, I think we have to start looking at the flows away from the border. I, I think we have to st we, we have to stop uh, uh, putting so much pressure on that infrastructure, which I think will be just given the nature of of democratic politics uh, and and it will be per per perennially underfunded. That's not to say that we don't need. Uh, I take your point. We 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 certainly need appropriations, but I think the 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 uh, the the Larger potential is actually reinventing the way we think about uh, borders and, and regulation and where we clear things. And the, 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 the area that I would uh, suggest that we, we, uh, we try to reinvent this is on e-commerce, right? So that, in fact, in the digital world, digital deliveries, digital ordering, uh, that we actually figure out a way to regulate that. Uh, and, then, and then so much of that would... would would eliminate the focus on, you know, stopping for for an inspection. Uh, but so I'm 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 agreeing, but uh, but I I don't think we're ever going to have the funding we need. So I think we have to think our way uh, more along the lines of uh, the, the borders being uh, north south rather than east west. And maybe they're not just the one spot. You move it, moving it out. I mean, opens it up. Preclearance opens that door. Um, to whatever we can put f together in the next 15 years to make it look better when we're done. So, thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists. I, I don't know if you all have just two minutes. We just have a very quick closing remarks from our uh, co-hosts today from the Board of Trade Alliance, if you guys just mind staying there so we can oh, just finish, okay. finish this all up. But Glafiro Montemayor, uh, who's the president of the Laredo's chapter of the Asociación de Empresarios Mexicanos, is going to, to say a couple words, and then Noe Garcia, president of uh, the Board of Trade Alliance also. I was told to, to do the remarks of the, of the whole day, and I thought the easy way to do it is to record the whole session, and I want to play it again for you, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So, because every, every conference was very important, but I would like to say, say something that, let's, uh, let's focus on, on, the, on back in February 2014, when the President of the United States and Mexico and the Prime Minister of Canada issued the joint statement of the 21st century North America building the most competitive and dynamic region of the world. Part of that statement threads, our region is among the most competitive and dynamic in the world. We have shared the vision for its future. What I mean here is that the conference that we listen today are precisely part of the corner store that we need to build that. 
we heard about the leg legisti le legisti legislative legis legislation opportunities to strengthen the border competitiveness. How can we fix the gap between infrastructure and the lack of uh, personnel and budget? How can we do all the the programs to adapt to the new technology that we need? And the first th step that is for both governments to acknowledge that we we the, the 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 two economic are connected more than ever that mexico and the united states are rather partners than competitors and the having a competitive border will affect directly one or many of the six plus million u.s jobs that depends on the export to mexico or that mexico is in the top destination of the export of the five states and vice versa mexico needs to understand that having a competitive border might give Mexican industry the edge the need to compete against any Asian company who wants to sell its product in its U.S. Uh, mix, uh, market. Another thing that we heard is that they had to build tomorrow bo uh, border today, and uh, I think the governments should embrace initiatives like Smart Border and promote trust travel program and embrace the advantage of technology provides, and in the future, Border crossing shall more shall, uh, shall be importantly port shall, be, shall build important ports and to entry shall be with standard of the post 9/11 uh, uh, standard. That is that we need to have sufficient place to have a lot of uh, area where we can allow to put programs like uh, like the fast because it's, 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 it is very very uh, frustrating that that. In some borders, the fast does not work because we don't have enough space. Like uh, there's there's bridges that the fast is only on the bridge space. You still need to do all the lane, the two-hour lane to get to the bridge. So the fast is only 200 meters. That's that's something that's not not worth it. Uh, we heard something about uh, building the U.S.-Mexico border for competitive of North American, and this is something very complex. It is not easy to approach this subject. Since it's very complex, because this is few, uh, for, uh, because we learned from the past. In 2011, when China joined the WTO, the Mexican maquila industry dropped 30% in 2000 in two years, and the trade deficit of the United States with the world ended in 2014 with 730,000 millions behind the the last year, the the past year. And uh, at last. A conversation on the evolution of the U.S.-Mexican co cooperation with the water manager. Uh, historically, building a new bridge, a new a new copy of entry, it's, it takes about 10, year, 10 years at least. And that's something that we may, will keep us always behind of what we need in the present. So there's something that is always in my mind, and I want to just put it on your, on your mind like a tattoo, that that uh, every day that we do not anything, we lose competitiveness. And every day, the words of the former ambassador, Medina Mora, that he said are more real for me. And he said that we have a 21st century trade with a 20, 20th century framework on the top of 19th century infrastructure, infrastructure at the border. And that's all for me, and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Noe Garcia with the Border Trade Alliance, and the first thing I was uh, asked to do is thank our sponsors, because without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to put together such a wonderful conference. Um, our sponsors include the International Bank of Commerce, Borderplex Alliance, ProMexico, Constellation Brands, Corona, uh, SMB Infrastructure, Manette Jones, Delphi, and Anzal Duas, uh, and McAllen Hidalgo Bridges. So. Thank you so much to our sponsors. If you could give them a quick round of applause, really appreciate their <laughs> contributions. You've heard from a lot of the thought leaders in Washington, D.C. today about a consistent theme. And that consistent theme is that our borders are not where they should be right now. They're not efficient. Um, they're not dynamic yet. 
They're dynamic in a lot of ways, but they're not dynamic how they should be. And organizations like the Woodrow Wilson Institute, like my organization, the Border Trade Alliance, and like AEM, give people on the border a platform to voice our concerns to Washington, D.C. So I encourage all of you, if you're not members of the BTA or AEM or contribute to the, Wilson, the Woodrow Wilson Institute for Mexican Policy, please consider it because we're a great platform. We're getting a lot of traction, as you heard from our speakers. And without this platform, we're not going to have a voice. So I encourage you guys to do that. Thank you so much for coming. And um, Chris, I guess, are we wrapped up? I guess we're wrapped up. And thank you for such a successful event. true though you know I passed that bill in 2006 we we cut the ribbon on the notion of the Otai East we got the president